Ladies and gentlemen, practices of cultural identity will begin at the Asia Society Theatre in five minutes. Please come and join us. Thank you. 各位來賓 ，practices of cultural identity 將於五分鐘後喺 Asia Society Theatre 開始。多謝。Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Gokdo Live. I'm Amanda Lee, curatorial assistant at Asia Society Hong Kong Center, and I will be moderating this talk where artists Mark Chung, Angela Yun. And Elaine Chu will be discussing their individual journey and artistic creations that have been molded by the cultural identity of Hong Kong. Most common adjectives to describe our city often include multifaceted, a mixing cauldron, international, and more. With that in mind, how do creative minds, such as our speakers today, hone their skills and accurately portray their artistic intentions in a home that is densely populated? And with a unique urban and natural environment, please welcome our speakers, Mark, Angela, and Elaine. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. Right. So we're jumping right in.、Um, first and foremost, to begin, I think what we all would like to hear is what is your individual interpretation of a cultural identity. Mark, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> For Angela,、mm. to me, I think、um, the history affects cultural identities a lot because、um, it shapes the current us. Without history, we don't know how we feel currently.、Mm. So I think it is、uh, good to know the history, the root of us, so we have a sense of belonging,、mm. and that's how we、uh, identify the cultural identities that everyone share. I don't think it need to be majority; it can be very diverse. Yeah. And、uh, that's my interpretation. Okay, Elaine.、Um, to me, I like to observe a change in cultural identity through our architectural setting of the city. Right.、Um, for me, I have observed、uh, um, the city's changing landscape through the urban redevelopment、um, phenomenon、um, throughout the past three years, and I have seen like so many districts are changing and、um, renew into like a maybe a different, whole, wholly different.、Um, New、um, landscape, and that's how I、um, have my cultural identity reflected in and observed through my paintings. Fantastic.、Uh, to me, it's always difficult to have a very clear definition of, of cultural identity. It's、yeah. always easy to go look back and see how things really happen. Yeah. So you sort、yeah. of you don't have a definite definition. No. But it's more of like an observation for now, because、yeah. Hong Kong's always known to be very fleeting. And it, which sort of leads me to my next question:、um, Does a city like ours have a fluid state of a cultural identity because we have so many distinctive communities that reside here? 
I do think so because like we used to have the cultural identity as CT San Sing San, yep. the Lion Rock Spirit. And then because it is because of the history that from the 1950s we were one of the uh, manufacturing industry and then 1980s we were one of the biggest manufacturing city in the world. And that is the age where when people it working hard enough, they get what they deserve. And that's why they keep their persistence and devotion to build Hong Kong nowadays. And I think now, um, also on top of that, I think um, because 50% of the population is living in public housing estates. Yeah. That's why I think maybe that is also a part of the cultural identity that most of them, they, they might share some experience living there, having the feeling of neighborhood. And the neighborhood is actually a sense of belonging where people hang around in the sh outside the open space or at the shop where the owners will give them discount uh, when they recognize it. And this is all kind of sense of belonging that they feel like, oh, it's home, it's, mm. it's homeland. Yeah. Well, as they further moving on to nowadays, then all, when all the, under all the urban development and um, the renewal, buildings and shops, they are gradually disappearing. And that's why the people are lacking some space to chill, to have a milk tea, to relax. And I think yeah. that, that shift the uh, cultural identities mm. further uh, varies. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I think, it, I think you make a lot of sense in a way where Hong Kong does not have that one answer um, because we just have so many varieties of the way people are brought up, of the way people are educated, or where they come from, because we have so many international families coming in. So I, I absolutely ap appreciate that as well. And Elaine? Yeah, I just resonate with Angela's feel so much. And I think Hong Kong's cultural identity has been so fluid. Mm. And from my observation, it um, can be um, answered from the changing of architectural um, spaces yes. and with its impact on human behavior because yeah. um, before it, like a huge wave of urban redevelopment mm -hmm. we can see a lot of organic elements happening on the streets like people can just set up some different signboards or can have a wet market yeah. just in between a tram world <laughs> <laughs> so like we can uh, have a lot of bottom-up elements um, be before like mm. the government or like a, like a sort of authority to mm -hmm. um, take control of the city planning. Yeah. So um, we can say that before um, that um, uh, geometric planning of yes. the city, we yes. can have a lot more free flow human activities yes. and like cultural activities going on. But then like after more and more like new like um, districts um, coming up, then we have more like top-down plannings, mm -hmm. and like what we do, we have to get overrised. We have to um, like get so how to say gentrified mm -hmm. when we do things, yeah. and that really affects our mindset and our identity and how we see ourselves. For sure, definitely. I think Hong Kong, in terms of architect, really holds a special place to us, and we're one of the cities that also has that. Um, thing where we respect our heritage sites, which is, uh, again, something that Asia society also resides in. So I think we put a lot of thought and love into things that we call home and things that we physically see that we call home as well. Um, Mark, do you have anything in particular that sort of defines that fluid state of cultural identity? Well, when we really think of the city, it's basically, it's, we're all immigrants and it's, when we talk about, uh, you guys were talking about cities and things under the Lion Rock spirit or whatever, it's, I think that leaves a very large part of, of, of the population out. For instance, the, the Indian immigrants, they've been here for generations and generations, but it, they're, they're excluded from that kind of spirit or whatever. But then when you, when you think about it, now we have a lot of Chinese, main, um, with a lot of new immigrants from mainland China. And in this state, I think it's a very, it becomes very, very interesting when we ask, we, we, we don't think that these are Hong Kong identity or whatever, but in 10 years or 20 years, they will be the new Hong Kong identity. I think in that sense, it's a lot, it's a lot more interesting. Right. How things yeah. are changing very, very rapidly. For sure. With 
constant immigrants coming in. Mm. Yeah. That's a very good way to put it because um, I also want to mention about your personal identities mm. and how that really contributes to not just your perception of Hong Kong, but really the overall cultural identity of this city. Um, Angela, you mentioned uh, you know, about the public housing. Can you talk a little bit more about that, um, about your exp experience? Yeah, um, because I was born and raised living in public housing estates, so that is my childhood. And that's why um, when I create artwork, I always look for this feeling to comfort me because that is how I see home as a child. And when I grow up, I always want to seek that feeling back. Because growing up in a community like that, you, you have a strong bonding of the neighborhood. Um, when the mom is busy cooking and she's running out of soy sauce, then you just take a bowl and <laughs> go to the next store. Yeah. So it is, it is that kind of close relationship that um, makes you feel like, okay, this is home, I feel safe. And um, that's why when I do my research and um, in my practice, I was always uh, love to involve neighborhood. Because like nowadays in Hong Kong, you still find so old family stores. They still run in romantic motions that maybe if they recognize you, they will give you a discount or it's not about money. Maybe you just need help and they will offer the, the, the helping hand. And this is lovely to work with them. That's why in my practice, I always love to involve the material or the found objects. Each of them, they are part from the neighborhood. Yeah. Fantastic. I think everyone who has seen your work can definitely feel that. There's that sense of whimsical um, playfulness that we don't, we, we've no longer have access to as much as before. Um, definitely in your series, we can definitely see that, Angela. And Elaine, for you? For me, I feel like my practice of painting Hong Kong landscape is like doing a self-portrait. And when I um, was um, sketching on street, I always look for different cultural elements or symbols. For example, the typography on signboards, like we have like um, Chinese calligraphy and then English, and sometimes it makes with Japanese. And it's the hybridity of this uh, landscape that really inspired me and speak to me. And at some point I feel like it is me, <laughs> Hong Kong landscape. And um, through searching more and more um, the Hong Kong landscape and its uniqueness, I s sort of feel like I have to go back and search within myself and what is my personal identity and how is it tied and like being reflected um, in Hong Kong landscape. So um, currently I'm working on a project, um, like a new series that worked, um, this, um, it's about searching within myself and within my personal memories and my personal identity and that's how I want to continue my search of um, cultural identity. That's fantastic. And I have seen your work, Celine, where it's very, for me, it's very interesting to see the drawings and illustrations that you've done where it's not a full, concrete, accurate depiction of a building. It's just often a, a blur, you know? So there's a blur edge, there's a segment of it, and then it sort of drips away. And I think that's really cool to see because oftentimes when one visits Hong Kong or lives here, we just remember some iconic feature in the building, whether it's a neon sign or the famous rounded corner of a building. I think that's really cool. And also, I'm pretty sure you know you're, you have intentions in using that specific color scheme. I often see that, especially in your more famous series, they, they're often sepia tone, very brown, very nude, very neutral. Is it to sort of like, um, what's that word? Is it to sort of enhance the features of that building or are you trying to put a sort of timeline to it? Mm, actually, through painting um, the buildings in different color scheme or like a very fluid language, it's, um, it's speaking a language of my roots, which is watercolor and like a Chinese um, representation um, of things, which is like more fluid, more transient, more transparent, and it it's more feasible in my early work, which I use a brown tones, um, watery color layering, and yeah, that is like my first attempt to kind of to um, speak out my Eastern root. Yeah. 
yeah, but then now I'm um, gradually shifting to painting acrylic, and it's my attempt to uh, uh, overcome the hybridity in me. Yeah, and also to make note that your latest series is a complete opposite because <laughs> you've, you've definitely veered straight off to a more colorful approach. It's very uh, fantasy-based, very sweet, very colorful, very vibrant. So I really appreciate that sort of transition, Elaine. That's really wonderful. Thank you. Um, for you, Mark, um, in terms of your personal identity as an artist, how does that contribute or in a way, how does Hong Kong's culture one contribute to your art practice? Um, to me, I think uh, if we if we're only talking about the landscape in Hong Kong, it's it's uh, it, it it shapes my practice in a way that when when I look at things in Hong Kong, we have all these very rigid rules, safety rules, uh, building regulations that gives us very, very strange things. For instance, you, you, you'll have to build a ramp on a street where no wheelchair can access yeah. anyway. Yeah. But these, these kind of very um, tautological existence of these uh, humanly built structure is, is uh, the, the absurdity of, 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 of their existence. It's somehow very, very related to my practice. Uh, you sort of want to highlight that in a way? Yeah, it tells us how stupid our, our <laughs> <laughs> the whole system is. It's, yeah, it's, it, it's, it it's very interesting in that yeah. way to me. Yeah, I think yeah. I know what you mean. There's certain, sometimes on some streets of Hong Kong, there's like unnecessary staircase. And like you just, you can just walk straight, but instead you have to go up and down for it. There's that sense of absurdity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I think is quite hilarious in a way. Makes your commute more interesting, I guess. Um, so for that in mind, Obviously, uh, Mark, you sort of answered that already, but in a way, does that really affect your practice here? Like, does that make your works here more distinctive compared to your other ones? I wouldn't say distinctive, but I, but to add more to that is, is uh, not add more, to like, more to, uh, how do my uh, identity or, no, uh, let's not, not Let's put it the other way. How, how do my living experience in Hong Kong affect my, my, my practice? It's basically in Hong Kong, you, you're always faced with these very um, uh, bearable uncomfort uh, or discomfort. That you, 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 we're always surrounded by the, the, air, the, the sound of the air con, the very drastic difference of, of temperature indoors and outdoors, uh, the very, very bad uh, weather during summer. We, we're constantly surrounded by it, and 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 in my uh, practice, I sort of highlight that uh, that discomfort and bring that out, and 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 and, and uh, try to make that experience a very central, uh, very in important part of my, yeah. my my work. Sure. So in a way, you sort of play on that concept of the everyday, the everyday of Hong Kong, because yes. of these little observations that you've made that annoys you, but we just have to move on because th that's just something we need to get by every day here in Hong Kong. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I, quite, I quite find that very interesting because seeing your work, there's the physical aesthetics of it really reminds me of Francis Alisa's works in a way where it's just sort of not mundane. Mundane's not the word, but you sort of contribute or participate in the everyday life. And some of his work does the same too because he talks about urban tension and geopolitics. And I find that quite interesting having to see that being performed in our home um, in a way. And Hong Kong sort of is converted into a very interesting playground for you to explore because you get to have these little trinkets to play with, right? Yeah, it's a playground, but instead of having fun, it's it's <laughs> <laughs> it's always very sad. Yes, very sad. Okay, yes. so there's a sense of melancholy there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great, um, Angela. For you, um, again, similar things. You know, how has Hong Kong's cultural uh, identity really affect your art practice because you've your works are known to be in my mind I, I would describe it as a sort of whimsical shadow puppetry and you sort of encapsulate bubbles of the city sort of a home within a home and you know in a way it reminds you of you trying to grasp a memory or something nostalgic I know you have a opinion about the term nostalgia so please by all means uh, explain it to us 
Yeah, my work mainly is a project, the silhouette of Hong Kong landscape using LED light and also the shadow of found objects. Those found objects are actually sourced locally uh, from the family-owned stores and also overseas vendors. So some of the toys, they are made in Hong Kong, while some are made in China. And all of them, they have 30 to 60 years old, so they have witnessed a lot of happening in Hong Kong. And um, I think that they I like symbol of the heyday of from the manufacturing city to become the um, economic transformation, become the entry port, and then become nowadays metropolitan. And those f old family stores, they are now, from where I, I source the toys, they are now gradually disappearing. So all this process from birth to death, like, um, the toys witness everything. That's why uh, I always like to include them and use them as a uh, subject to project their shadow. And you can see, like, it is, each of them, they are like a part of the story of Hong Kong. And then when you gather the story together, it becomes the story of Hong Kong. Yeah. And um, it's like the city, uh, because the installation is a kinetic device, so it rotates, and you can see the shadow of the Hong Kong landscape, it rotates. You can see the up and down. Um, whenever you blink an eye, then you would, it, the next building just disappear in your sight. Yeah, so I think uh, it, is, it is sad that uh, the city develops and uh, the buildings or the store, they vanished because it is not a sense of um, nostalgic being, but I think it is the sense of belonging where you feel like, okay, this is home. I have something to clean on. This is the shop where I used to hang around with the shop owner. And that is the place I where I chill with my friends, but it's no longer here. And I think it is um, the memory that would give you a smile when you recall it. That is the important part instead of, um, because it, it's all episodic memory. It's, it's something you just grab from, from all. And is that why you add that kinetic element to it? Because you want to highlight that thing of like grasping hold of something that is no longer there. I think it's like you need to pay full attention to the landscape because it's ever changing. It's just one glimpse. Uh, or one blink, then it's just gone. Yeah. It's like um, maybe three or four years later, when you look at Mong Kok or Shen Wan, these two districts are under big uh, redevelopment now. So you, s you see it as a familiar district, but then it's no longer the place where you used to get used to. So it's different. For sure, definitely. Um, and for you, Elaine, how has, you know, sort of that affected your practice? I think it's just deeply rooted and um, impacted my whole practice that Hong Kong landscape is ever changing and um, myself is also um, ever developing. And from my earlier work, I um, observed the ur urban redevelopment, which is like my main um, topic to talk about. So like this painting is my um, on location sketch which I um, bring out my easel on the street and I would stand on the street for one to two hour and then um, have um, to observe the um, cities or the, uh, the district's um, temperament. And then I would develop to like acrylic paintings and these are ex exhibited last year in JPS gallery. And then this year I'm bringing it on because um, of the pandemic and the cities um, um, phenomenon right now, I want to like transfer it and um, search within myself and my childhood to memory and to bring out some hope or to create a wonderland for people to um, enjoy in some way and also to think about um, the line between reality and fantasy in my work. Fantastic. And obviously today's topic of about cultural identity, we obviously need to deep dive into the current art scene that we have here. From your, all your personal experiences, how has the current art scene developed so far?
Mm. The silence is very loud. <laughs> yeah. Uh. I feel it's blooming again with this year's Art Central and Art Basel coming again, and we finally have in person events. And I feel very lucky to be able to catch on this trend or be able to born in this age that uh, local artists can be seen by international uh, audience and also be supported by a, a local gallery. And yeah, just feel so lucky to be part of it. Yeah, totally agree with you. Like we, um, I think uh, Art Center and Art Basel start 2012. And then before that, we have Art Walk, Hong Kong Art Walk. And apart from art fairs that would give uh, young artists the opportunity to showcase, I think there are getting more and more non-profit organization that would organize artist studio, um, residency, and um, exhibition space. So I think that also helps a lot because, uh, well, 20 years ago, we artists rent uh, in industrial buildings and then uh, they have a lower rent and they can have a studio space, but then now it's become more uh, unaffordable. So I think this organization, they help a lot. And uh, also I think, um, because being a full-time artist is kind of, sometimes it's very unstable for income. And uh, it's good to have that slash. And you can do part-time and people are so used to being slash. And to earn a living and, and at the same time you do as a full-time artist. So uh, I think this is how the artists uh, is doing and I think we Hong Kong artists is tends to be more conceptual uh, we we like even if it is a painting or installation or sculpture we always base with our concept we start with that first and then we further develop well I think um, in terms of resources uh, there has been definitely a redu reduction in re resources towards the whole local art scene for the last two years. That's very, very obvious, but that's very sad. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> but uh, instead, I think for the last two years, the energy has been more and more vibrant. Um, of uh, Artists would, instead of, uh, when you don't give me resources, I will start something on my own. You sort of have to adapt through the yeah. constraints. I think given. that has been very, very, it's, it's very obvious that we have all these uh, artists self-initiated projects here and there now. I think it's sad, but it's also very, very, yeah. yeah. It's like growing pain, essentially. Yes. It's, yeah. it's not something we like, but we, we do learn to adapt yeah. and really find our strengths within that. Yeah. It's a really cool observation. Um, with that in mind, with the limitations and everything that have that were given to us in the past two years, has that changed the choice of medium in your art practice recently? Because of the lack of accessibility, did that change? Yeah, it has a direct impact on me because I used to be like a outdoor sketching person, but with the pandemic and like the restriction, I could not um, do it so easily, right. and um, that sort of inspired me to um, change my focus to uh, my state of mind, my mm. inner world, right. and to work in my own studio. Mm. And uh, I thought this would be a, like a um, difficult moment for yeah. me as a sketcher artist, but then it helped me grow. I don't know. It's mm. just the pain that yeah. helped me develop and go on another level. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I'm glad you found <laughs> something. <laughs> Angela and you? Uh, because of the COVID, a uh, lot of old family stores, they decide to close down. Yeah. So uh, I've been collecting f uh, plastic toys for eight years. Yeah. And these two years is like, boom. Ev right. Every shop, I, I know they are closing down. And I need to rush to the store uh, because unlike chain store, they don't have a regular stock ticking. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of um, old fashioned uh, products yeah. at the store somewhere. Yeah. Because you know, like it is not a um, chain store with yeah. organized goods arrangement. Right. 
they have their unique language it's of arrangement. It's a hole in the wall. Yeah, it's no, like treasure yeah. hunt. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it's these two years I've been busy going to every district. Um, mm -hmm. Either they are under urban development or they, because of the COVID, the pandemic, then they decide, okay, uh, maybe we will just get retired. Yeah. Then uh, I will just uh, grab as much as I can mm -hmm. uh, before they are finished without yeah. a trace. Yeah. At least I get a trace of, of, of right. their footprint. So you sort of had to hoard essentially uh, yeah <laughs> to sort of hoard and collect until like god forbid something bad happens at least you have something yeah that works in your art practice yes i mm. i think especially in some show yeah. and also uh, some older district mm. um they they just some some shop that i know they they even have a notice like they decide okay maybe we'll just end it this month yeah yeah so it's uh, quite sad to get yeah. to know because uh, I think uh, maybe they would be still be here for a few years. It's right. not about business. It's, no, no, it's no. just about the, it's quite tiring. Yeah, it's tiring and also these shops, you know, even though I've, I'm, I would, may have never visited one, I do respect it as it is part of our cultural identity. All these little nooks and crannies, hole in the wall shops. Some people grew up, you know, be befriending the owner or knowing exactly what is on the menu, and those things are, are no longer there. They sort of ex uh, disappeared in a way. Um, I think that's sort of the very sad, bittersweet part of our cultural identity because it's so fluid. These things will con constantly change and being replaced. Having said that, because of things being created constantly, has there been any challenges for you guys in terms of exhibiting here in Hong Kong? It doesn't have to be challenged. It could be something great too. <laughs> Just for exhibiting? Yeah, exhibiting, creating uh, in Hong Kong. Um, I was lucky to have held my solo successfully last year Fantastic. in May, yeah. but there was some limitation, like there couldn't be like a opening reception. Mm. But um, it sort of drives us to put things online or we broadcast at the like the talk or like we have a uh, online viewing rooms or something like that so mm -hmm. it's the change in format and it actually helped to promote it to like overseas audiences through digital medium so mm -hmm. it's cool fantastic okay great um for you mark anything um the difficulties for me is because all my my works are not all my works, but most of my works are very very immersive, uh, not large scale, but immersive installation that changes the whole space. Yeah. So I find it more and more difficult for me to be in a group show, and if I want a solo show, no one would show me because my production cost is just too high, and it's very difficult for me to find a space to really exhibit my work, uh, a space that's yeah. That works with your practice. And Actually, I, I, I with my practice, it, uh, it's very ad adaptive, so I, I can change. Uh, I, according to the space, I can change my work. Mm. S but then I might not have the money to rent that space, yeah. or I might not have the money to make any adaptations uh, according to that space. Okay. But that's my yeah, that's my limitation. And it's, it's gotten a bit more difficult the past couple of years. Not really. It, it, I think it has always been very difficult for right. me in, in that respect. I think. Right, yeah. Right. Right. Does yeah. that actually affect the way you pick your mediums then in your art practice? Well, I'm, re I'm always reducing now. It's it's in so instead of building very big stuff, I stop building stuff now. So everything could be done on site. So there won't be a lot of. Light, large scale production and stuff that I'll, I'll keep all the actual works very small and installation will be done on site so that would save me a lot of storage costs yeah, very smart costs. actually <laughs> I, I otherwise I, I couldn't yeah. continue practicing that's yeah. the only way yeah so um jumping on that as well does that sort of make your work stand out like say does that make it stand out amongst other Asia-based artworks? 
since your work is often revolves around Hong Kong as a city? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, not only my work. Uh, in general, uh, artists in Hong Kong, they make very small works. Mm. I think that's, yeah. that's very small, very condensed, very, yeah. yeah. Other than those painters that sell all their paintings in one show, they can make ba big paintings. Mm -hmm. Other painters usually they, they just make very small paintings. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's very not unique, but it's 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 a very common thing in Hong Kong that people instead of we always think about storage. Yeah. <laughs> we always, always. <laughs> yeah, always think about storage whether you can fit it into the lift. Yeah. These are the two things we always think about. <laughs> so no one <laughs> wants to pay the stair fee ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. In that in that terms, I think it stands out because we all, we're always thinking about these two things: storage and th the size of the lift. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys agree as well? Yeah, totally. I think storage is a problem because I also do did some installation before, yeah. and it's hard to store because you you a scale like uh, my work with the threads with the tiles, and I basically subconstruct another room in the exhibition space. So you can't really keep all the elements and it's hard to sell as an installation, rather in a smaller scale, because I think majority of Hong Kong people, the home scale is relatively smaller. That's why I think they are preferring to have smaller scale work. Uh, unless you have museum collections, then it's doesn't matter the size. Otherwise, it's always frustrating. After the exhibition, where should I store the work? I don't want to just dump it immediately, but after like five years or six years, you will consider, okay, um, maybe I should consider <laughs> dumping it, yeah. and then I will recreate it when yeah. I have the next exhibition. Right. And I observe that it is how installation artists do. Mm. Like even for our seniors, maybe yeah. they no longer have the installation they did 20 years ago. Right. They need to grab, um, because it's also found objects, they need to grab current one instead mm -hmm. of the old ones mm -hmm. to recreate the installation again. So mm -hmm. I think it's hard. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Elaine, for you? For me, I feel lucky that the gallery is taking um, care of the logistics space yeah. <laughs> of uh, recreating and also yeah. the sizing problems. Yeah. Mm. So uh, I feel like um, for the uniqueness of Hong Kong artists, there is um, it's just the diversity that we experience every day daily right. yeah. that um, inspire our own work, and we are like standing in between cultures. And yeah, it's difficult to find um, like a identity for us, but yeah. once um, if we like follow our souls and mm. follow our roots and if we find it and it's so unique if mm. we yeah do it. Fantastic. And you know, our city has gone through so much for the past few years. Are there any current or recent things that really inspired you for your next project that we can hear about? Anything? I feel like it's the whole circumstances uh, the whole what? Sorry? The whole circumstances of the society, which right. is like more, or uh, we're going through a depressing times, and that inspired me to um, hold up my uh, responsibility as an artist to give hope and to create something more imaginative for people to um, look at when they are upset. <laughs> so in a way, it, it, it actually inspired to be more positive, not, not positive, but more like inspiring and hopeful, right, in your works? Yeah, I guess like when more and more shops or like buildings are disappearing, like Angela has said, um, I feel an urge to, urge to turn into my imaginative world, which is in that world is unlimiting and I have um, resourceful uh, memories in my childhood and that could be um, told as a story or inspiration to like younger children or to many people <laughs> actually um, about it and that could be something I can do in this difficult time. Fantastic, that's great. Um, Mark, do you have anything? Um, I've just came back from, yeah, from Europe and I've right. just done that seven days quarantine. Right. 
but on the way from Zurich, I fly, I flew through uh, Istanbul, and when I was in Insta Istanbul, I saw a long queue of people, maybe 150 people, and everyone they were holding a folder, a clear folder, and inside they had their PCR test, the accreditation letter of the PCR test, uh, the, the hotel booking, and everything. It's in, it's in that folder. I didn't do it. I, I had everything on my phone and they didn't let me board. I was stuck in Istanbul for a day. And then the next day, I did everything like the rest of the people. But, but when you th really think of the rules when for you to come back, it's very difficult because you have to